today I'm going to preach on one of the most fundamental message about biblical love, and that is to love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul in very clear terms state that he who has kept this command has fulfilled the entire law. Now this notion of loving our neighbor as ourselves used to bother me a lot as a Christian. And I always thought that this is an unattainable command. Of course, some of us would take it passingly and didn't think deep into what it means. Or some may think that this is nearly a religious notion to spur us on to good works, as if we would just do some good deeds or help some poor soul along the way, we are good with fulfilling this command. But if you look ourselves in the mirror, we know it's not. We may be doing some good deeds to people, but we are definitely far from loving others as ourselves. And in the face of our sinful nature, we know we, how distant we are in terms of this command. If any Christians were to take this command seriously, the very first perplexity that he would have is how on earth is anyone in this sinful world able to love others as ourselves? It's a high view, yes, but it's not attainable. Because at any one time in our life, we are faced with the reality of our selfishness, which is provoked by our sinful nature. Sometimes we couldn't even love our spouses ourselves. We could be so consumed with our own needs, our own convenience, our own feelings that we neglect theirs. And so if we fall short of that command and not being able to do anything about it, in effect, it makes us lawbreakers. And I don't think any Serious Christians would like to live with that kind of smear conscience. Or another way I realize that Christians tend to take this command is to take it conveniently through what God has done for us, not what we can do or what we should do. And this is becoming quite a popular notion that I've heard from some believers. Um, they said, you know, Christ has fulfilled this command for us. He has loved others as himself by dying on the cross for our sins. So we, we just by putting our faith in Christ, what he has done has been imputed to me, credited to me. So I have in effect fulfilled the requirements for this command. Have you heard that kind of explanation? I mean, yes, for the part on imputation, in fact, by putting my faith in Christ, I have fulfilled not just one, but all the requirements of the law through Christ, which is, though, why we are lawbreakers, we are not condemned, right? We are sinful, but we're not condemned. But when Paul gave this command in the book of Galatians about loving our neighbors as ourselves, he wasn't talking about imputation, all right? He wasn't talking about regeneration either. Instead, he was on this subject on, on sanctification. He was talking about how we should live as Christians, as new creations, and not gratify the sinful nature as how we've done so in the past. So as Christians, I would say we should not conveniently escape the demands of this command. In fact, the more thoughts we put into this, the more clarity we have about this command, about loving our neighbors as ourselves, the more liberty we would enjoy in Christ. Because prior to this command or instruction given to believers, Paul was actually talking about the Christian freedom. Now I point you to the context to which Paul has given this instruction in the book of Galatians chapter 5 verse 13. Now you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be what free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled. In keeping this one command, very simple. What is that? Love your neighbor as yourself. See now, this is a high call of excellence, I would say, to love others as ourselves. And this instruction is given in conjunction to freedom in Christ. And so yes, we are not bound to condemnation if we fall short of it. But we will fail to enjoy the freedom of Christ if we neglect keeping such a biblical instruction. 
So if we value freedom, we must dive into the text to understand clearly what it says so, so that we can reflect on it, understand it, seek it, and obey it. And I always say freedom doesn't start from doing what you want. Freedom starts from knowing the truth, what Jesus said. If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. So distorting the truth or having blurry lies about the truth doesn't help in our Christian liberty. It works against it, in fact. So now, let's get to it. What about loving our neighbor as ourselves? I would like to split this biblical command into two parts. Okay, First is about loving our neighbor. Second is about loving them as ourselves. So two parts. You got it? And so I will deal with the first one first. Loving our neighbor and deal with the second part to love them as ourselves. The second part. Okay. Now on the part of loving our neighbor, I want to say first that one of the biggest misconceptions is that because of God's universal benevolent love for mankind, there was a Christian notion that was wrongly brought up in church history, which tend to see all humanity as our brothers, as God, as our Father. Now let me say first, that's not true. Only Christians are our brothers. And we are to love our fellow brethren with a brotherly love, which is beyond the love we exercise to non-believers. Amen to that? Even that, even having said that, Biblically, we are still called to love all men because all men are image bearers of God. You know, though we are radically fallen and our image was marred and distorted, but you must know that image of God is not annihilated. And that is the reason why killing men is different from killing animals. You saw in the Old Testament? Killing any man carry the capital punishment in the law. But we are not called to, to see all of them, all men, as our brothers, as I said again. We don't share brotherly love with any man on the street. But there is a relationship which God has established among humanity. That is, all men are my neighbors. And in a broad sense, I am called to value all their lives and their human dignity. At no time should I trample on human dignity or treat them less than my equal. But now having said that, in a practical sense, am I supposed to go onto the street helping any needy fellow men I've seen on the street? Am I to do that? Now, to answer that, there is a very significant passage in the Bible where our Lord Jesus himself show us what does it mean to love our neighbors and what does it mean to value the dignity of our fellow men. Now we turn to Luke chapter 10, okay? Chapter 10, verse 25. I will read to you this passage. On one occasion, an expert in the law, usually when Bible talks about expert in the law, most probably they are the Pharisees, so he stood up to test Jesus, and teacher, he asked, What must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, How do you read it? And so Jesus asked him. He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourselves. Now you have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Now, for those of you, you want to know, you want to inherit eternal life, there's two ways. <laughs> there's two ways. One is unless you keep all the law or you accept Jesus Christ. There's only two ways, okay? And so, after hearing this, you know, the man said, the lawyer said, he, he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, if we take a pause here and understand the background. The background of this was an occasion where Jesus was tested by the expert of the law with regards to the law. 
and the summation of the whole law was brought down to just two commandments. You know, first to love God with everything you have in you. Next, to love our neighbor. And here, the expert of the law tries to test Jesus again with a very difficult question about who then is my neighbor? And in fact, the reason that prompted this question is that I suspect, I suspect that this expert of the law felt a prickling on his conscience. Now, we must understand for, for these Pharisees, this expert of the law, they tend to pride themselves in observing the law. So they self-deceivingly believe they have kept the first command. They, they tell themselves, well, I have loved God with everything in me. Okay? Not that they had, okay? but they just convinced themselves that they had. Now, that's the problem of self-righteousness. Okay? So to them, there's no issue with the first commandment. But now the expert of the law is confronted with a question on whether he had loved his neighbor as himself. Now surely he has been kind to his friends and fellow experts of the law. But maybe he hasn't been so to the ordinary folks. He has most often been judgmental. He has looked down on ordinary people many a times and disregard their benefit. Jesus pointed out a lot of times, you know that. So in the face of the commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves, I would presume that he has consciously narrowed down the definition of neighbor to his probably circles of friends and circles of families, fellow colleagues. He is most probably only kind and benevolent to people in his own circles. And so here he tries to justify himself. And the Bible indeed says he tries to justify himself. And the way he does so is by posing a very intentional question to Jesus. Then who then is my neighbor? And our Lord Jesus replied with a story, a very popular and renowned story about the good Samaritan. In fact, this story was so popular that even the non-believers heard about it. I don't know if you know in Singapore there are awards given to Good Samaritans. Do you know that? <laughs> and um, there are people who are deemed as kind, helpful. And there's also the Samaritan hotline. I don't know whether you know. The Samaritan hotline who provide emotional support to people. Now, if you are depressed, you can call that. You know? they, are, they are nice people voluntarily providing counseling to helpless people. And the name Samaritan were actually drawn from the biblical allusions of the Good Samaritan story. So now let's read. Let's read about the story. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. Now presumably, this man is a pious Jew. Because he was going down from Jerusalem. And we know why Jews go up to Jerusalem. Most often the reason is to worship God or fulfill some vows in the temple. And after he, he was done, he went back to Jericho, which if you are familiar with the landscape settings of Israel, that, that would be a close to 30 kilometers road and much of it with desert-like condition. And given that this is an isolated terrain with only people who are doing trade or religious pilgrims they use that road people on this road actually were very easy targets for bandits and indeed this man was targeted okay so he was caught by the bandits they stripped him of his clothes beat him and ran away leaving him half dead now these robbers were merciless apparently but what happened after this was even more apparent. Verse 31, a priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Now, what was he thinking? We don't know. It could be he was familiar with the prevalence of robbery in this area. So he might be frightened and he wants to quickly move on. But the fact that... He was a priest. It's undeniable. And a priest is supposedly leaders of God's people. They are like mediators for the people of God. They were tasked to conduct sacrifices 
for the people. They are to take care of the spiritual health of the people. But here he saw a pious Jew, a fellow brother, being beaten almost to death. And he was indifferent. He was unconcerned. So verse 32, So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw the injured Jew, right, passed by on the other side. And Levites, we know they serve in the temple. They, they are like full timers in the church. Okay? But that didn't provoke any compassion in him for the fellow brother who was badly injured. Verse 33, but a Samaritan, a Samaritan who was neither a priest nor a Levite, he wasn't even a Jew, but as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. Now, I mentioned this many times. You know about the story of the Jews and Samaritans. There are deep enmity between the Samaritans and the Jews. They were ethnic enemies for almost a thousand years, they were enemies who lived next to each other. And people from both sides, they didn't talk to each other. But here is this Samaritan taking pity on a fellow man, a fellow neighbor, so to speak. In verse 34, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And these things are not cheap in those days. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. Now, do you notice? There was great initiative in the way he deals with this injured man. He wasn't impatient. He wasn't frustrated. He wasn't hasty. He really wanted to make sure he recovered in good hands though he could be busy and need to run off the next moment, but he was not slipshod in dealing with the injured man. And, and which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Jesus asked. So the expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Now every time we talk about mercy, we know it means forgiveness, but in, in certain instances, it also means loving kindness. So the one who had mercy, who had loving kindness on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Meaning to say, if you were to love your neighbor as yourselves, you do how the Samaritan has done it to the Jew in a whole context of the circumstances. And remember, doing is what counts. Don't just harbor the idea of doing. Don't just console yourself with having the thought of doing but really execute it because you shouldn't believe that you've loved your neighbor unless you've done it. Amen to that? All right, now let's go further in, in, in expounding the verses. Of course, um, I'm very mindful. We don't want to commit expository mistake by saying that this good Samaritan represent the Lord Jesus. And St. Augustine used to say that and he was criticized. Now, though we don't say that, but surely this good Samaritan did exemplify our Lord Jesus when he selflessly and magnanimously helped the poor injured man. So let's understand some main principles from this message, uh, from this passage about loving our neighbor. So what about loving our neighbor? Now, first we we try to think about the reaction of the priests and the Levites. Now, the priests and the Levites, what about them? You look at them, they knowingly, not unknowingly, but knowingly, leave the injured Jew aside. They saw the injured fellow brother, and they passed on the other side. Now, whatever their reasons could be, whatever reasons, whether is it because they are fearful? Yeah, we know fear. Fear creates immense pressure. It takes away love. It takes away empathy. It, it makes us self-absorbed and we have to pray against that. I'm not denying that, okay? Could be fear. Or in this case, I will ask, could it be their busyness? Busyness. Now I would say we Singaporeans are really busy. 
busyness indeed makes us indifferent and sometimes feelingless. And most often than not, we don't care about others' feelings when we are busy. We just want to offload every of our burden to others when we are busy. And I'm sad to say that sometimes church food timers can be so busy that we become indifferent to others' needs. We may care so much about the spiritual needs of people and neglect their emotional and physical needs. Or it could be that both of them thought this person could be dead, and so they thought since he's dead, we can't do much anyway. So they passed by. Now, whatever reason they gave is not a good reason. Because the only reason that they fail to do something to their fellow man in need is because of their lack of love. And one of the things that signify their lack of love is none other than the word indifference. Indifference. Now, I want to say that. Being indifferent is the worst of all non-loving attributes. Being indifferent is the worst neighbor we can be. It's worse than being a noisy neighbor or an inconsiderate neighbor. I know some people can be inconsiderate or temperamental, but when you are in trouble, they come to help you. Right? Imagine my house is on fire and my neighbor just shut the door, doesn't care. You know? Or someone wants to break into my house, my, my neighbor saw it and he doesn't care. And say if you have a young kid and someone bullying him, and some passerby just walk by, you know, uh, I just don't look at it. Just walk by. Can you imagine how evil it is? <laughs> no. Indifferent. Indifferent. And do you remember at the beginning stages of the COVID where people were quarantined when diagnosed? Some of us were diagnosed. <laughs> no one buy food for them. And not even their own family members, our own relatives. You know, but uh, with loving brethren who buy food for these families, I always remember these things. Some of us bought food, knock on the door, stand at distance, put on masks, and, and talk to the family members. Are you okay? You know? At that time, when you do that, right? That's really loving your neighbor. Right? It's not just the act. It's about not being indifferent in fearful situation. And I can tell you, fear really makes us indifferent. Busyness makes us indifferent. Helplessness makes us indifferent. We always hear people say, I couldn't even cope with my own issue. How am I supposed to help others? And as a pastor, I can tell you I'm always challenged by that kind of thought every day. I'm so busy with my family. I'm so caught up with my kids. Sometimes I don't even have time for my pastoral duties. And when there are people who desperately need help, the tension is always there between being indifferent and being concerned, being involved. Now, I can't say I've done it perfectly all the time, but as a person who is called by the Lord to love our neighbor as ourselves, I always find myself having to deal with the tension uh, and, and to confront that challenge when it comes. Now, the Good Samaritan show us his involvement, his concern for an injured man. He values a man's dignity. To him, this person is badly injured. He can be dead, but he's not, like, not a dead dog. He's a human being. He has to be treated with dignity. That's why he goes to him. So that, okay? So, you must recognize the problem first. We're living in an indifferent society. And that's what stops us from loving our neighbors many a times. The second, another question we want to confront is, are we to help everyone on the street then? I ask that, right? Are we supposed to help everyone? Now, let's take a look at a good Samaritan. Who is his neighbor in this case? Obviously the injured man, right? But on a practical sense, we are not to go to the hospital and render help to all the sick and injured people there. Am I right? So on the question on who is our neighbor, yes, in a broad sense, it is all people. It involves all humanity. But specifically, listen, specifically the neighbor whom God 
wants us to show love and do good to is one whom we came across with a genuine need. It's a needy person whom God brings to our attention. Now, the Samaritan don't meet injured people every day. But in this case, it happens that he encounters this badly injured Jew. It is a divine appointment, I would say. It just so happened that God made him walk through that part of the terrain in that long desert-like road. And it just so happened he met a fellow man who is badly hurt. He met someone who is weak, fragile, and in a bad shape. So in this case, that person is God's designated neighbor to him and he is obligated to be a good neighbor and not doing so is equivalent to not loving your neighbor he's not supposed to leave him in the lurch right so ask ourselves who did god bring to us today it could be our spouse who is emotionally unstable it could be our child who needs our attention it could be our fellow brethren who has real issue in his life. It could be a colleague who is stricken with depression or is facing marital woes. It could be anyone, but you know it is God who brought them to you. And God has shown you their problems. You know they are in a desperate situation. It is either you turn a blind eye to it or you initiate an engagement and render your sincere help. Now, I see that nowadays we are very very afraid of what i call emotional mess there are times when people tell me pastor i happen to know there's a problem with this sister she's in some kind of trouble you know but i don't want to ask too much you know because if i ask she tell me all the mess she is in i have to follow through it's very messy i'm very busy i have no energy for this <laughs> you know sometimes people tell me don't ask you know once you ask you activate something you know you have to follow through <laughs> Now, I understand that's often the case. <laughs> that's often the case. And that is one reason why people deactivated their blue tick on WhatsApp. Because what goes on inside the mind is I don't want people to know I'm online. I don't want people to know that I've read the message. I don't want to feel obligated or pressurized to give a reply. I'm very busy and I'm very busy thinking about this. Now, I understand that. I understand. Everyone has that in them. But honestly, that mentality may not work towards being a good neighbor because, because it is inward looking. It is always about me and I. I don't, I, I don't want pressure. I don't want burden. I don't want inconvenience. Now, I understand times have changed. And there can be new challenges, but we have to pray to deal with it in the most man-loving way. We have to be honest, sincere, and upfront with people not to escape from people with a real need. And over the years in my pastoral life, I've learned to say no to people, or I'll come back to you, or I'm really busy at the moment, but I'll do my best for you. Now, we are commanded by the Bible to shoulder each other's burden. And learning to shoulder burden is actually a step towards learning, loving our neighbor. Okay? That's for point two. Now, I'll bring you to point three. Another thing about loving our neighbor as ourselves, as shown from this passage, is about overcoming secondary differences in doing good to men. Now, I've said, ethnically, the Samaritan and the Jew has a difference. In fact, a really big hostility in terms of their ethnic identity. But in the face of a desperate need, that difference that hostility is only secondary. Now, let me say this. With frequent human interaction, and especially for us who live among people, we, we all have our fair share of secondary difference. I have people who tell me, I really cannot stand this co-worker, the way he does things. Or I cannot stand that colleague, the way she curry favor with the boss. Now, we all have our negative vibes about people. But maybe some of you could even have neg negative bites about me. You know? I, say, I'm, I really cannot stand the way the uh, pastor does things and he inconvenience me or whichever. You know? I don't know, it could be, you know, or I could feel the same way about you also. But you see, you see, we are only humans. 
in the face of a desperate need, we must put all secondary differences aside and help each other. And I would think this is in line with what the Bible taught us about loving each other and to even love our enemies. And if you really have a problem now, I say, please come to me. Huh? Don't worry. Huh? I, say, oh, I don't know whether the pastor will help me. You know, I just showed him some face last week. No. It's okay. You know, Just come. Just come to me or come to each other. We are called to shoulder each other's burden. Don't worry about that. There are many differences. There are secondary issues. Because if you really take heed of the word of God, in Romans chapter 12, verse 21, it says, If your enemy is hungry, you feed him. If he is thirsty, you give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So you see, when, when someone has nothing to eat and drink, this is serious business, serious need. So if we have an issue with another person, our score with that person should be settled in another way. But we must be objective and compassionate enough to cater for his or her needs now, if it's a desperate one. We have to overcome evil with good. And that is a call for excellence in terms of our relationship with people. And this is what we must always remind ourselves when we talk about loving our neighbors. Sometimes they could even be our enemies, people who malign us, who hurt us. I'm not saying we don't deal with the wrong. Sometimes we need to deal with injustice and we will deal with it someday if the Lord willing. But as of now, we learn to overcome evil with good. Help your enemies. Pray for people when they are in desperate situation, even when they hurt you. Do not gloat over their misfortune. If you've learned this, you would have emulated the Lord Jesus. And such mentality stemmed from the biblical principle of loving our neighbor. Amen? And then another thing about loving our neighbor is following through our good works, especially towards people in need. And that is shown by the exemplary act of the Good Samaritan. He went the extra mile to make sure the injured Jew is really well taken care of till he recovers. It's a great example of following through our good works. Now, following through needs more than just an act of kindness. It needs stamina. It needs determination. There must be a loving intention to really want the needy person to benefit or have their critical needs met. That's the point. As 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7 says, Love always perseveres. There is no love without perseverance. You love your children, you persevere in nurturing them. Perseverance is love. So loving your neighbor and doing kindness to them is not the touch and go or doing just for show. It's taking up real responsibility for the well-being of those whom God entrusted to us. That's what the Samaritans did. But of course, I understand there are some people with very difficult, long-drawn problems in their lives. And helping them requires a lot of time and energy. And that is why sometimes when the pastor and preacher don't have time to continue the engagement, the church has to have workers and counselors who does the follow-up work with people. It's in the governing principle of the church not to leave helpless people of God alone. And of course, there needs to be say, good policies for financial help. There needs to be meaningful engagement for people with mental and emotional issues. There should be safeguards. Loving and helping people must always be coupled with soundness and fairness. I understand that. But the initiative to render help and not leave people of God alone to sing in their problems must be there. And this is based on the principle of loving our neighbors. We recognize that we may not be able to help everyone in the public community, but the, the neighbors, as even people whom God brings among us, have to be helped to a reasonable extent 
even though we may suffer some shortfall. And don't think about getting something back when we help others. The story didn't end with Good Samaritan receiving twice as much material blessing after the good deed. It didn't end with that. But what he has done is commendable in God's sight. Okay? And last, even though it's not mentioned here, now I'm going to be done with the first point. First main, I'm coming to the last point, the first, first main point. Even though, now it's not mentioned here, but in the context of the gospel, when we love our neighbor, we are to love both their body and their soul. Am I right? And the Christian good works are not merely humanitarian good works. We help people in many ways, bearing in mind that their soul need to be helped most. So we cannot be contented with just providing financial aid to them, visit, visiting them physically, and rendering them emotional help, but not bearing in mind that their soul needed to be helped most. Their soul needed to be ministered. We touch people with good works, but we should always look for opportunity to bring the gospel to them. Or even if we are helping a brethren with a physical need, say by accompanying them to see the doctor, that's a physical need, but we have to encourage them or pray with them so that they can continue to put their trust in God. And this is something we must not forget because in my years of serving the Lord, I've seen Christians who are just contented with helping people with their physical needs and they forgot altogether about the pressing need to minister to people with the gospel. They became such an expert in rendering physical and psychological help to people, but they don't know how to share the gospel to them. As such, we will see churches in the start to skew towards societal good works, teaching typical moral values, but in all these, they lack spiritual substance. Now, that's not loving our neighbor to the full when we know there is a final judgment awaiting. The soul of man is worth more than the whole world. So now I've given five points about loving our neighbor. But I want to end with loving them as ourselves, as ourselves particularly. Yes, to love them, we know it's a Christian obligation, but to love them as ourselves seems to raise the bar to a level which is presumably unattainable for the imperfect man. Because as I said, at any one time of our lives, we are guilty of loving ourselves more than loving others. It seems like a divine standard that, that only God can do it, only Jesus can do it, right? But I beg to differ. I beg to differ because if it's a standard which only Jesus can do and man couldn't do it, then the apostle wouldn't have given this instruction to the Galatians believers. Now, I, I, would, I would say to love our neighbor as ourselves, listen, to love our neighbor as ourselves is not a divine standard per se. Rather, it is a divine standard applied upon a human standard. It is a standard for men to love others in accordance to the standard he already has in loving himself. Because the implication within is as much as you love yourself, you love others the same way. And God is not saying you love man till God's standard. God is saying you love man till the standard you have for loving yourself. Now Martin Luther says this interestingly. If you want to know how you ought to love your neighbor, ask yourself how much you love yourself. If you were to get into trouble or danger, you will be glad to have the love and help of all men. You do not need any book or instructions to teach you how to love your neighbor. All you have to do is what? Is to look into your own heart. And it will tell you how you ought to love your neighbor as yourself. You see, so in effect, sometimes you even, don't even have to look into the Bible for specific instructions on how to treat your wife, your children, your parents, your friends, your colleagues. All you need to do is to look 
into your own heart. And this can be applied in two sense, two senses. One, I will call it the active sense. The other one, the inactive sense. And then I'm done with this, okay? So let's go to the active sense. I would say this is the golden rule, okay? The active sense is simple. It can, in fact, be drawn directly from the scripture. Matthew 7, 12. Jesus said, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. It's active. Do. You have to do something. Do to others what you have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Do to others. It's active. If your heart desires people to be kind to you, be kind to others. If your heart tells you that you desire your spouse to love and respect you, you do it unto him or her. And it's not supposed to be transactional. You know, some people say, Pastor, I've done it. I've respected my wife, but she didn't respect me. No. It's not supposed to be transactional. It has nothing to do with having the paid back. Rather to love others as yourself, it's a command. It's a call for obedience. Anything transactional is not obedience. And I can tell you this is the golden rule. And it satisfies most teachings about love. It can be applied almost in everything. So if you desire your house to be clean, make it, make it clean if you live in another's house. Simple as that. Or parents say if you don't like your child, take sweet stuff. So you stop your child, you say, no more, that's too much, no more. But then, just when you say that, if another child there feeding himself with sweets uncontrollably, how many of you parents actually bother to stop that child? I know, that's enough, kid. <laughs> Most don't do it. And some people say, well, we don't do it because that's not my child. I don't have the right to exercise control. Well, if you say that, you have to ask your heart. Is that really the reason? Or probably it's your lack of love, or it's your indifference for the other person's child. Never mind if he takes sweet stuff, as long as it's not my child. Never mind if he's glued to the iPad, as long as it's not my child. You got, got what I mean? Now, you have to run through this in your conscience. And remember, remember, God has our heart. He knows the very reason or motive why we do or do not do certain things. Now, I'm not accusing any one of you. I'm not saying we can, I can be perfect either. But I want us to be really honest with our heart before the face of God's truth. Because only if you're honest, then you will pray towards it. So that is the active sense. So how about the inactive sense? Simple also. The inactive sense is do not do. Do not do what? Do not do to others what you would not have one others do to you. Now let's read from Paul about loving our neighbor in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15 again. Uh, let's read through this again. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. And notice what comes after this. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. Now this is a very ugly description. Biting and devouring each other, it's like, it's meant to be used on wild animals. Obviously Paul is using a, what we call a hyperbole. You know, hyperbole meaning it's an emphasis, or even an exaggeration. But I presume what Paul actually meant is about believers dealing with each other really selfishly. In a sense that we accuse each other, we malign each other, we slander each other, we put each other down, we talk behind each other's back, and all these easily will cause a retaliation. And why do we all why do we do this? We ask ourselves sometimes. And most of the time, it's because when we criticize someone, put someone down, it seems like we elevate ourselves. We feel good about ourselves. It's like we, we are knowingly uplifting ourselves because I'm not that bad, you know? And Paul said, if you do that in the Christian community, you're going to destroy each other. And it's pathetic to know that many a times 
We believers are not destroyed by Satan. We are not destroyed by the world. But we can be destroyed by each other. So now we come back. When Paul was talking about loving each other as ourselves, he used a really, really negative example to show believers how we should refrain from doing evil to each other. And what is evil in this case? That is, listen, that is, you don't wish to be treated this way, but you are doing it to others. And in this case, I'm sure no one wants to be bitten, no one wants to be devoured, no one wants to be put down, to be slandered, or to be shamed. So the golden rule, in the inactive sense, is if your heart tells you that you don't wish to be treated this way, then don't do it to others. Don't do it to others. Sometimes I have people who, who come to me and say, Pastor, I'm not angry with an imperfect person. But I'm really angry with people with double standard. And I can tell you our sinful desires makes us practice double standard in a lot of ways. In the way we treat people, in the way we respond to people, in the way we reply messages. And if you don't want people to speak to you in a demeaning way, you don't speak to others in that way. It's a basic rule of love. It's a basic rule of respecting human dignity. And I can tell you, my brethren, and most often than not, our sins are usually not grievous, heinous crimes, but they are mostly in the form of double standard. And there was once a brethren who happily told me, you know, on my phone, having some problem, you know, so I quickly sell it. Good thing I managed to get rid of it. Someone brought it, you know. But in my heart, when I heard that, I was perplexed. I was perplexed. You ask, I, my heart, you know, do you want to buy a lemon? <laughs> you know, lemon, right? <laughs> I mean, you buy something, it doesn't work. Or, or what, you call it a lemon? If you don't wish to, why do it to others? Now, I, I believe we make similar mistakes all the time. It may not be pertaining to a product, but it could be, an attitude we portray or a choice we make, we hate it when people treat us this way, but we are sometimes subconsciously doing it to others many a times. Now we fall short in a lot of ways, but we have to understand what the notion of loving our neighbor as ourselves means, and then start to seek perfection as how our Heavenly Father is perfect. Be perfect because your Father in heaven is perfect. We may all fall short, but we must be true to its call for excellence and let Christ be who we should turn to when we fall short. So with that, I end with Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. God doesn't drive us away in our weaknesses, in our inability to love others as ourselves. God wants us to draw close to Him. Now, there's no way we could love and love perfectly unless we know how to draw help and grace from God, who is the source of love. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, dear Lord, we thank you so much for this message. It's a very basic command that you have given to all your disciples. And it's plain and straightforward and if we think through it and meditate upon it we know a lot uh, we fall short but despite that you have accepted us you have loved us as yourselves so Lord we thank you and we want to hold on to the promise of drawing close to you and find grace to help us in our time of need and help us, especially and with this message, that we first of all learn to be honest to our hearts in the face of your truth. And so that sometimes 
in our ability, we come to you and find mercy and find strength. And we can also strive to be perfect as how our Heavenly Father is perfect and help us in this Christian journey of loving others. Thank you so much. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.